Good evening. I'm Jonathan Levy, the director of the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability. Given tonight's theme of social justice, I think it's appropriate to start this evening's activities with Miami University's land acknowledgement. Miami University is located within the traditional homelands of the Miamia and the Shawnee people, who, along with other indigenous groups, ceded these lands to the United States in the first Treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Miami people, whose name our university carries, were forcibly removed from these homelands in 1846. Miami University now houses the Miamia Center, which serves the Miami tribe community, and it's dedicated to the revitalization of the Miami language and culture and to restoring that knowledge to the Miamia people. And with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 15th annual Jean and Carol Willeke Frontiers in Environmental Sciences Distinguished Lecture Series featuring Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. This year's Frontier Lecture for the 2021-2022 academic year marks the 53rd year of IES, making it just a little bit older than Earth Day, which is celebrating its 52nd anniversary tomorrow. This is Earth Day Eve. Before I tell you more about Jean Willeke, let me take this opportunity just to say a word about Dr. Gary Barrett. Dr. Barrett was one of the founding members of IES at Miami University 53 years ago. He was one of five main people, um, and he died just two weeks ago on April 10th at the age of 82. He was a faculty member in the Department of Zoology from 1967 to 1994 and a distinguished professor of ecology. And we're sad to see Dr. Barrett go. This lecture series was funded by Dr. Jean Willeke, who sadly died six years ago. Jean was the longest serving and most influential director of IES from 1977 through, through 2004, 27 years. He was instrumental in making the Institute a vibrant and relevant, internationally respected program. All who had the privilege of working with Jean knew him to be a kind and gentle man, a great teacher, and a leader. He inspired students, he encouraged colleagues, he explored new ways of thinking, and always asked challenging questions. In 1999, Jean was awarded the Harrison Medallion, Miami's greatest honor. Jean was a leader in interdisciplinary problem solving, and he invented what we now call the Willicke Wheel, and it's still the approach taught here at Miami for addressing environmental issues. All, the, uh, all our graduate students in the MEM program out there are very familiar with the Willicke Wheel. Jean's first wife, Carol Willicke, was an instructor with the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Miami University, where she taught community organization and welfare. Then she worked with what is now the Office of the Advan for the Advancement of Research and Scholarship for 25 years. She was an associate director in charge of human subject review and compliance and worked on proposal development. In 2007, to honor Carol's memory, Jean endowed the Jean and Carol Willeke Frontiers in, my, in Environmental Sciences Distinguished Lecture Series and instituted a fund to support workshops on volunteering in Oxford. Both of these community activities symbolize a continuing tribute to Carol's concept of community spirit. I'm so happy that Jean's second wife, Pat Willeke, is here tonight along with their son, uh, with, with Jean's son, John Willeke. And I'm thankful for Pat's continuing support of what we do here at IES. And uh, she has told me that um, Jean would have really enjoyed our speaker tonight. So now that finally brings me to introducing our 2022 Willeke lecturer, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Dr. Ali serves as the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation. He's the founder of Revitalization Strategies, a business focused on moving our most vulnerable communities from surviving to thriving. 
Before joining the National Wildlife Federation, Mustafa was the senior vice president for the Hip Hop Cop Caucus, excuse me, a national nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that connects the hip hop community to civic process to the civic process to build power and creative positive change. Prior to that, Dr. Ali worked for 24 years at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He began working on social justice issues at the age of 16 and joined EPA as a student, becoming a founding member of the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice, the OEJ. Before leaving the EPA, he served as the Assistant Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice and, and the Senior Advisor for Environmental Justice and Community Revitalization, working to elevate environmental justice issues and strengthen environmental justice policies, programs, and initiatives. I, I just want to share with you that Dr. Ali, uh, we had arranged to meet at a certain time on Zoom just to make sure everything was running properly, and he was just a little bit late because he was caught up in meetings at the White House. Dr. Ali has worked with more than 500 domestic and international communities to secure environmental health and economic justice. He is frequently seen on television, appearing, uh, including appearances on MSNBC, CNN, Vice, BET, Full Frontal with Samantha B, and Democracy Now. So now, um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. Finally, the opportunity to bring together resources uh, to meet the needs of our most vulnerable communities, which in essence gives us the opportunity to strengthen our country, to strengthen our respective states, our counties, and uh, our communities. That is the moment that we find ourselves in. Um, I have some friends who often, when COVID first hit, where we talked about uh, uh, the pandemic that was going on. Um, because we saw all the disproportionate impacts that were happening to communities of color, that were happening to indigenous brothers and sisters, and that were happening to lower wealth white communities, and beginning to unpack how did we get to this moment. It's the same thing when we begin to also unpack how did we get to this climate crisis that we currently face. And not only how did we get here, but what are the actions and steps that we can take uh, to begin to mitigate many of the impacts that are happening and at the same time uplift our most vulnerable communities. Uh, we'll take that journey together today. Um, and I wanna thank you for taking out time from your schedules um, because I know everyone's got a million different things that are going on. So you honoring me with a few moments of your time, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I wanna begin our journey and uh, I uh, wish that I was there with you in person. I, I really love being around folks. Um, but uh, we're going to be in this Zoom format, and I'm going to try to pull up uh, this particular document uh, here, and we're going to get started. So just give me one quick second, and we will get moving. Let's see if we can get it all going. So I'm just going to walk us through some things here in a second, but... For us to be able to take this journey together, we have to unpack uh, many of the things that got us to this moment. Um, and that doesn't mean that we have to be anchored to the past, but we've got to understand many of the steps, many of the uh, both challenges and sets of opportunities that have happened that have brought us to this moment. Um, my grandmother has a, a saying that she shared with me when I was a small boy. And she said that when you know better, do better. I want y'all to think about that for a second. In many instances, there have been choices in the past, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional, that have had you know, significant impacts, whether positive or negative. I really appreciated Dr. Levy sharing with folks and us doing the land acknowledgement because you know, policy, which many of you either currently deal with or will at some time in the future, uh, frames out so many different things that happen in our lives. Um, and we know that policy played a role uh, in the impacts that have happened to our indigenous brothers and sisters. It was policy 
um, and the sets of actions that were tied to that, that actually removed our indigenous brothers and sisters from their traditional lands, traditional lands in Ohio. And then of course, we've seen the Trail of Tears and a number of other movements of indigenous brothers and sisters from their land to the least desirable locations. If we're having an honest conversation, it wasn't like folks said, well, we know that you're in this particular area now, but we've got a much better place over here. And, and of course, they, you know, there was no um, allowing of folks to be able to say, well, that's not what I'm interested in. We also know that when we removed our indigenous brothers and sisters, we took them away from their traditional foods. And by doing so, weakening um, their communities, weakening their nations. Um, so we have to be very honest about that conversation. And we see a very similar set of dynamics that have taken place in relationship to African-Americans. You know, folks going to Africa, enslaving folks, bringing them to this country for free labor, taking them away from culture, taking them away from traditional foods, um, uh, and a number of other dynamics that we will see uh, play out the ripples throughout history um, that would still see some of the things that are going on today. We know policy also played a role with our Chinese uh, brothers who played a significant role in building the infrastructure inside of our country, uh, especially our railroads. And you know, there for a time, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, you know, how incredibly important infrastructure is. Um, but we also see that policy was used once folks helped to build our infrastructure, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act to say, you know, no more. Uh, we see in a very similar dynamic that played out in relationship to our Japanese brothers and sisters in internment camps uh, during our world wars um, and their land being taken away, rights being taken away, all these different dynamics that we have to be aware of when we start to take a look at, you know, some of the impacts that have been going on for decades. Now, how did we get here? Some of it was tied to our sets of actions that played out um, and then disinvestments uh, once we place people in the least desirable areas. We also saw policy playing a role in trying and effectively doing for a long time, and thankfully it's no longer the case, you know, taking away women's rights to vote um, and being able to own land and a number of other dynamics that we know are important in our country and being able to garner and, and, and make wealth. All of these things are tied to policy. And we'll unpack uh, some of the newer sets of policies um, as we take this journey together to see, have we evolved uh, as a country, um, as a government, um, as a set of people? And uh, we'll play that out as we move forward. But policy, even though it can be something that can have devastating effects, policy also has the ability to be transformative. You know, women being able to finally begin the journey of equality. And we know we still got a long way to go, but the women's suffrage movement began to galvanize. Where does power truly come from? Power comes from people coming together, people making a decision that some things have to change and being willing uh, to not only lean in, uh, but to utilize sometimes some of their social capital uh, to be able to um, make sure that their voices are being heard, being able to actually influence the process. When we see those things coming together, then we know that change can happen. And when that set of energy is put in place, we also know that we can begin to change laws or we can begin to get the right laws in place. We can get the right regulations and statutes and all these things that are incredibly important in helping us to build healthy and sustainable communities. We saw also, you know, the dynamics that went on, we talked a little bit about um, Africans being brought to this country, being enslaved, and then the Jim Crow laws that were in place. But we also saw that when men and women of good conscience come together, uh, African-American men and women, uh, white brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters, Latinx brothers and sisters, those in the faith community, uh, those in the business community, begin to galvanize around a set of issues, then change can happen. Change doesn't happen overnight. It takes consistency and it takes folks being focused on being able to actually reach those goals that um, are being put forward. And we saw that also in relationship to the civil rights movement. 
And I always appreciate these pictures because it brings in the reality of the situation that was going on when folks' rights had been stripped away and then the rebuilding of those over time. And it takes a number of folks coming together to make that happen. You know, it's interesting also that when we start to take a look at some of the things in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, we see that the Industrial Revolution was really starting to, to move in a very significant way, even though, you know, we've got 150 years of Industrial Revolution, but we also begin to see the dynamics of redlining and restrictive covenances, um, and then eventually zoning which really said that we are going to push certain folks into certain areas. We're going to disinvest in those communities. Um, and then you're going to have to kind of fend for yourself. And what you see in that dynamic is that you also will have uh, those who invest in certain areas and not in other areas. So you get the more negative types of industries that then are the only thing that will be cited in certain areas. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. But- Mustafa, may I, I, can you just switch to uh, presentation mode by hitting the little screen at the bottom of your, you can just uh, right by the, yeah, right down there, go to the left, to the left. To the left. To the left, right, right there, yep. Sorry, y'all, I thought I was- <laughs> I thought There I was we go, that's gonna be, that's gonna be better quality. There we go. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Thank you. So now we're, you know, I want to bring us forward just a little bit. 1968, Dr. King was killed. Um, but also in this same year, uh, a couple of years as we move forward, we also begin to have the environmental movement. And as you see in some of these pictures that are, are moving forward here, that as we move to 1970, and as we are now with the 52nd anniversary of uh, Earth Day, that we begin to get very focused on policy and being able to make change. Uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, RICRA, many of these things that I'll talk about here in a second are a part of those sets of actions and that energy and that power. But all of that is driven by people, um, our voices, our stories, our power, uh, and the, both the disproportionate impacts that are happening in our communities, but also the sets of opportunities to make real change happen. You know, it, it is often, you know, children of color and communities of color that are dealing with the most significant sets of impacts along with lower wealth communities and indigenous communities. So today we continue to fight. We're fighting uh, to be able to breathe. We're fighting to be able to have clean water. And we're also fighting to make sure that there's actually clean air. Um, I want folks to understand that we've got over 200,000 people who are dying prematurely every year in our country from air pollution. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from gun violence. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from car crashes. More people are dying from air pollution than are dying from the overdoses of drugs. We got 24 million people who are dealing with asthma and 7 million kids. And these air impacts we find across the country and have huge health impacts, whether in urban or rural communities, there are a number of different sets of challenges that are going on. The 48217, which is not that far away in Detroit, um, has some of the highest cancer rates because of the sets of exposures that folks are dealing with. But it's not just in urban communities. 96% of our national parks are now dealing with significant air pollution and the impacts of the climate crisis. So we have to be very focused. And in communities, like the picture that you see here, the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, when you go there, you roll down the windows of your car, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. Kids are supposed and expected to be able to learn in that situation. And we know how difficult it is in school just on a regular with everything right. But when you have these types of impacts, it makes it tough. Or you can go to Wilmington, California, where the diesel death zone is. High, high rates of both cancers, uh, liver and kidney diseases, and a number of other dynamics that are going on because of the air pollution that has been placed in many instances inside of these communities because of how close they are placed next to it. We often say that clean air is a human right. You know, we take 20,000 breaths a day. Some folks are breathing in clean air, other folks are actually breathing in toxic air. And that's a dynamic that we can actually change. You know, our indigenous brothers and sisters have reminded us that, you know, water is a human right. We have over 2.4 million miles of fossil fuel pipeline in our country. That's enough to go to the moon and back twice and be on your way again to the moon. 
we see these pipeline fights that are going on across the country because folks are trying to protect that natural resource. And at the same time, they're also trying to make sure that we are minimizing these impacts that are going on. In my work, I work with a number of artists and entertainers as well who are also focused on trying to highlight these impacts that are happening and bring attention. Uh, whether we're talking about down on the Bayou Bridge pipeline uh, or what was going on with uh, Excel um, or the Dakota Excel, excuse me, or a number of these other pipeline fights are going on. If water is truly a human right, then we have to stay focused. And when we don't, we know we have the instances like the Flint water crisis where kids are being exposed and now they're dealing with neurological issues, lowering of IQ points. That's little Miss Flint. We've done a lot of work together. She's a little bit older now, but Benton Harbor, Michigan is actually on the other side of Michigan and they have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint did. I want y'all to imagine that for a second, having higher levels than Flint did. There are over 3000 locations across our country right now that have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint did. We have to stay focused. The petrochemical uh, facilities uh, not only create some of the things that we know, but they also play a big role in the plastics. And we know that there is a huge amount of plastics that is now in our water bodies, whether it's our rivers or our streams or our oceans. And if we don't act today, then we know that the challenges are only going to get larger. In Detroit, as an example, uh, folks don't trust the water. And um, because of that, there've been a number of shutdowns. And here's some dynamics that people might not be aware of. The communities there, they were actually losing their homes because they were not being able to pay these exorbitant bills that were going on. And then some folks were even um, almost losing their children because they were labeled as an unsafe living condition uh, because of the water issues that were going on there. Water is life and we have to be extremely focused on making sure that we're protecting that. And there are all these great organizations that are out there. Wawa, which is in Atlanta, works with kids. They're doing water testing. They're doing all these different types of things to actually make sure that real change is happening. And you know, we've got one uh, 1.5 billion uh, bottles of uh, water that um, are actually rolling up on our shores and we've got to be able to change those dynamics. People are talking to us right now about there being more fish, um, less fish in the ocean than there actually is plastic pollution that's going on. And that's why we have to continue to be very, very focused on making this change happen. Well, we have to do it in partnership with communities. Art plays a critical role in also helping to bring attention to things. Um, and I wanted to share this photo with you because all of that is made out of the plastic that was found on the beaches. The other part of this climate crisis and also the runoff that's happening from farms and other places is the algae blooms that are showing up across our country uh, and the challenges that are being placed both on wildlife and on human life uh, because of those sets of exposures. And there are a number of campaigns that are out there like the Clean Water for All campaign. A big issue um, that's going on also in a, in a number of areas across our country right now is fracking um, and folks not knowing some of the chemicals that are being used in those processes. Um, you know, we've got over 72 trillion gallons of water that has been impacted from fracking. So we have to make sure one that people understand the chemicals that are part of the process, but also the challenges that are currently going on. Um, because there continues to be uh, a greater and greater need. We see what's going on right now in relationship to what's happening in Ukraine and people talking about energy independence and wanting us to be able to get more natural gas, to be able to drill more. We've seen in the news, the various uh, conversations that are going on around the permits. And when we are not focused, what ends up happening is those impacts uh, that are happening from pollution in black and brown and lower wealth white communities, they are driving the climate crisis. They are driving these sets of hurricanes um, that are having impacts all across our globe, but in our country as well. Um, so we don't wanna make sure that anybody has ever forgotten. And we're lucky that we have these influencers who are also trying to keep a spotlight uh, on the sets of opportunities and the sets of challenges that are happening. And you saw Beyonce there who stepped up during Hurricane Harvey, used her brand, used her platform to help to educate folks. And then of course the impacts that happened in Hurricane Maria. And again, this is because of our utilization of fossil fuels um, and a number of other dynamics that are there. And we continue to lose lives, those faces that often are not seen. Um, so once again, you know, we bring forward these amazing artists who help to highlight and bring attention and then keep attention on the issue so that we can actually make real change happen.
because we know the flooding is happening. The flooding that has happened in Dearborn, the flooding that happened recently in New York and New Jersey, the flooding that happened in Ohio. And as you see here on the flood map that we have in front of us, Ohio is number three um, for the risk that's associated with what's happening in this moment and what's coming. We've seen the stories of folks in Florida who were flooded out. In many instances, these are folks um, who are least able uh, to be able to deal with what's happening in relationship to the storm. But I want to bring this forward for everyone quickly also. You know, our, many of our Latinx brothers and sisters are working in the fields. When you see those wildfires, you see people losing their homes. You also have folks who are still working in the fields as those flames are blowing up. And we also know that we continue to have these billion dollar climate crisis events that continue to happen year after year. I believe we had about 21 of those uh, last year. So we have an opportunity to make real change happen. The change can affect and will affect everyone. But if we make sure that we are lifting up the voices of our most vulnerable communities, infusing it into policy, uh, making sure that resources are going to the spaces and places that need them the most, then we're moving in the right direction. And the clean economy plays a role in this. And we'll talk more about this here in a little bit. But the clean economy gives us an opportunity to do good and do well at the same time. It gives us a chance to strengthen our country to make sure that these new sets of manufacturing, whether it is around wind or solar or thermal or tidal, that those are coming back home to the businesses and spaces that um, had lost jobs over the years you know, in Michigan and Ohio and West Virginia and Kentucky and a number of other locations, we have a chance to lead this new revolution um, to make sure that we are creating the new businesses that will fill this space. And these can be jobs that happen here in our country. If we don't, China will fill the space. They've been very clear. Yes, they are burning fossil fuels, but they are also making huge investments uh, in the new clean economy sets of opportunities. What does it look like when we transform communities? It's like the Regenesis project that you're going to see here. They took a $20,000 grant and leveraged it $300 million in changes. They had old shotgun housing. Some of you all know what that is. You open up the front door and you can see out the back door. We got uh, 500 new green homes in and lowered people's electricity costs from $300 to $400 a month down to $65 a month. And we got new healthcare centers in the community there actually utilizing solar, but they're also meeting the needs of seniors and others. We got new green community centers in place and healthcare centers that are offering uh, economic opportunities, but also meeting needs that the community has. And then we also are going to a new 35 acre solar farm, which will zero out people's electricity costs. So people are going from paying $400 a month down to zero dollars for their electricity. And then we've got to prepare the next generation. You know, this is a STEM school that's a part of the Regenesis Project, where you have these just amazing young kids who, when they go through the program, they know uh, all the elements and how to put together wind and solar and androids. And that android you see there, those kids who would often be forgotten, played a big role in developing that. But when we talk about resiliency, we also have to look at projects like this happening in Austin, Texas you know, where people are literally looking at these new technologies and they're building them out. We have the opportunity to create new worker training programs like Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice. They got a 92% placement rate for returning citizens and others. In Iowa, if we're gonna get ready for resiliency, we've gotta make sure that we've got the maps that are in place and the new technologies that help us to be able to predict where the flooding is going to happen so we can get the right things in place. And one of my personal passions is around food justice and addressing food insecurity. And many people are now doing the vertical farming so that we can produce what's gonna be necessary. We can win on the new clean economy. You see examples like the Women's March and the People's Climate March, where you have millions of people coming together to push for change. And then, of course, the Science March is incredibly important because it's hard to get scientists to come out of their labs, but when they do, they can do some amazing things. And we've seen that in the past and just recently as well. And then young people have to be honored as they're pushing for change, whether it's the folks at the Green New Deal, or This Is Zero Hour, or a number of other amazing uh, youth-led organizations. And then, of course, Black Lives Matter plays a role as well, because many of our communities have been saying, I can't breathe, long before we had to deal with what was happening in relationship uh, to some police officers. We have to have the legislation in place. The Environmental Justice Act of 2021 and 2022 is just one example of how change is happening. And we've got to make sure that we're building partnerships with our state, 
and county and local officials so that when we talk about resiliency and adaptation and these new sets of resources, that we have all the voices together to make change happen and honoring what communities are asking for. EJ40 and the 2021 infrastructure bill is examples of resources and I will unpack that in a second, but I wanted to also highlight that we've got to make sure that on the state level that we have the bodies in place to help people to be able to move forward. And of course, we have to continue to divest from fossil fuels. We have to have a just transition so workers uh, are not left behind and that they can be a part uh, of this new clean economy and sets of opportunities that we have in front of us. I had to throw in the hip hop caucus uh, because of the amazing campaigns that we had because to win on these issues, we gotta make sure that people's vote is protected, that people are educated, and then of course they make the choices that they do. I never tell anybody who to vote for, but I do say you should vote for somebody who cares about your community. Um, and luckily there are a number of folks who are out there and we probably a bunch of folks who are watching tonight, you should run for office to make sure that real change uh, actually happens. And this is why we do it. We do it for the new generation, this next generation of amazing, amazing leaders. Um, and you make sure that, uh, you know, the guy who's right there, um, that, um, that he's not the central point. It is all these other amazing individuals um, who have realized that they have power um, and that by having power, there is responsibility for us to be able to engage, to lift up the voices of those who often are unseen and unheard. Um, so that we can make real change happen. Um, so I want to now sort of unpack a little bit more. Just give me one second. We'll see if we can get out of this. Because so I want to have a conversation with everybody um, about some of the opportunities that we have in front of us that you may not even know exist. So when we look at some of the things that I just shared, um, there's just this, this transformational moment that we find ourselves in. Now, many of you have seen some of the scientific reports that are out there, whether they're coming from the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment that have shared with us that we have um, some benchmarks that we need to hit. And if we don't hit those, then that there's a greater chance of some really significant things happening um, at each level that we might go to. And for a lot of folks, that can be scary. It can be scary because we know one, that it's gonna take resources to be able to address it. It means that there's gonna to have to be power sharing, which is incredibly needed and important in the process. It means that there's a new set of education that has to happen um, because everybody's not at the same place on their journey. You know, some folks, um, and it's becoming much fewer, um, no, you know, might not think that the climate crisis is as significant as it is. And we understand that when we see the floods, when we see these wildfires, when we see the hurricanes, when we see these extreme heat events um, that put stressors uh, on our seniors, they put stressors on uh, young children, um, they put stressors also on folks who may have some immune challenges and a number of other diseases, then we know that there is a new paradigm that we have to put in place to be able to really move forward in the way that's going to be necessary. In this moment, we also have to be mindful of the fact that when we saw some of those pictures that there are numbers that are associated with them, but even more importantly, that behind and on those numbers are communities that are dealing with these situations on a daily basis. So we've got the environmental injustice situations that are going on, and I'm gonna talk a little more about that. And then we've also got the climate crisis, which will exacerbate many of the impacts that are happening. And then we have a set of opportunities that if we infuse them and we really get behind them, then we've got a formula to be able to mitigate a number of the impacts, to be able to address the health challenges that are going on, and at the same time, to be able to also create wealth and sets of economic opportunities for communities. I wanna just real quickly take y'all um, across the country with some of the places that you may not have had the opportunity 
um, to visit um, so that we can unpack some of the things that are going on. And then I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, some of the amazing folks that have been a part of my journey um, that are, are really focused on trying to help make change happen. So there are places like Cancer Alley, um, and I wish I could like see folks in the chat to know if, if you, um, it, what your responses are. You know, Cancer Alley is between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, it is a cancer corridor, not so different than the diesel death zone that we talked about, or you saw some pictures there um, in California. Uh, cancer Alley uh, was founded um, uh, as a freedman community. Many of you may know what a freedman community is. Uh, folks who came out of slavery, um, located in certain areas, um, and began to build thriving communities. Um, and when you go to Cancer Alley, and as far as the eye can see, you will see petrochemical corporations um, and other polluting facilities. Uh, some of them, you know, football size, multiple football size um, footprints, if you will. And they built all around this community or communities. And now these folks have some of the highest cancer rates in the country, just, out, just amazing rates of cancer, liver and kidney disease, breathing difficulties, uh, a number of other sets of challenges um, from the exposures that are coming because of, of where they're at. You know, you have places like Institute West Virginia, um, not a huge distance from where you are. Institute West Virginia, for those of you who have spent time there, um, you know how the mountains are set up um, and the sets of exposure. So people, when I was um, in college, I used to go visit some of my friends who were there and, and their dads were getting cancer at 40 years old, um, 45 years old. Um, it was because of the sets of exposures that were going on there. And even to today, they are still um, dealing with uh, these sets of challenges that are going on. You have places like Princeville, North Carolina. Many of you maybe have never heard of Princeville, North Carolina but the communities that are there have been dealing with, and just like folks in Ohio, been dealing with these historic sets of floods. Um, in Ohio, you know, you all have had to navigate 100 year floods and now that number is kind of ratcheting up a bit as well. Um, there in Princeville, North Carolina, they've had to deal with 500 year floods where communities who had been there for, you know, 100 plus years of being washed away and now folks can't get the insurance that they need because of the changes they need to make to their homes, but their homes no longer have value. Um, and you see these types of dynamics where we have these catch 22 situations in our most vulnerable communities, whether we're talking about black and brown, indigenous or lower wealth white communities where folks are being trapped um, in these cycles. Uh, and we have to assist folks in being able to address the impacts, but also have to help them to be able to break out of these, um, these lower wealth economic situations that have played out because of, you know, many of these sets of uh, impacts that are going on. You have places like the South Side of Chicago, um, where you have the toxic donut situations, where you have 17 different sets of impacts that are going on. And you, when you add it all up, it's a cumulative set of impacts. And our current sets of laws um, and policies have not yet evolved into being able to address what's happening in that space. And that is the next set of work that people are focusing on. But in this moment, this transformational moment, we've got a chance to change a number of these dynamics by being able to pull in the right sets of resources, um, centering them in the work that frontline communities are doing. You have the National Environmental Justice uh, Platform. You have the Environmental Justice 40 that I'll talk about in a second, where communities and frontline organizations um, have brought together a set of solutions, and now the resources are finally out there to be able to link up or some of them. That doesn't mean that we don't need more resources. So let me just share with you a little bit that you might not be aware of. So sometimes we turn on the television and we'll hear certain things that are going on in Washington, D.C., um, but it doesn't really resonate with um, how that has significance in our own personal lives. 
So when you look at something like um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure bill gives us an opportunity uh, to finally address some of the crumbling infrastructure that we have in our country and also some of the non-existent infrastructure that we find in both rural and urban communities. One of the reasons that that's important is that when we look at water quality in our country, we've got 60 million people, 60 million people who've had to deal with unsafe drinking water uh, over the last decade. And in many instances, um, it is tied to old infrastructure. It is tied to uh, crumbling infrastructure. When we look at that bipartisan infrastructure bill and the $1.2 trillion that was a part of this, you know, it gives us an opportunity to now rebuild our infrastructure in both rural communities and urban communities so that we can have safe and affordable drinking water. But it also does a couple of other things that we often don't talk about. Um, many of the folks who work in the water infrastructure field, um, um, many of them have been older and many of them are going to be transitioning um, you know, to retirement. So it gives us an opportunity to have a new set of workers who are coming into that space. It also gives us an opportunity to really begin to embrace entrepreneurship um, and a new set of uh, business opportunities that will exist also for folks. The bipartisan infrastructure bill also gives us an opportunity to address some of the egregious things that happened in the past in relationship to transportation. So we know that there was biases and discrimination that was built into transportation policy because roads were often used to break communities up, to separate communities, to bring wealth into certain communities and to dump off pollution into other communities. Now with this new set of resources, we can begin to make sure that when we're building our new highways and roadways that, we are, um, that we're thinking in a very critical way, about some of these disproportionate impacts that have happened in the past. And why that's important is that one of the major drivers of the climate crisis is what's been going on with our cars and trucks um, and the emissions that are coming out of there, but also for many lower wealth communities, for many black and brown communities, and for many indigenous communities, there also has been those exposures um, because you know the traffic patterns will run through their communities, will run next to the schools, will run next to the daycare centers. So we have an opportunity to be able to address some of the things from the past by doing better as we're moving forward. There also will be huge economic opportunities for folks who decide to participate in this space um, around both contracting and subcontracting opportunities. There's an opportunity for us to make sure that we are building and supporting more natural infrastructure as well to deal with some of the runoff that is going on and to be able to capture some of the pollutants that are part of that process and to put less stressors on our water infrastructure. Through this new set of resources that are part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we also begin our journey um, around the new clean economy. Um, and, and for me, the clean economy takes, um, it's all interconnected, but there's two sets of opportunities. So we have the opportunities that exist um, around wind and solar and thermal and tidal and a number of other things that are a part of that space. And when I think about those sets of opportunities, especially around advanced manufacturing, there are all these various parts that are a part um, of the building of those four or five items that I just mentioned. I think about when I go home to visit my mother. So my mom lives in West Virginia. And when I'm driving home from uh, DC to Maryland and then coming through Western Maryland, just as I'm about to go into West Virginia, when you look up on the mountainside, on the Maryland side, many of you maybe have done this before, you'll see these giant windmills. And um, you go another couple hundred yards and you drop down onto the West Virginia side of the border and the same mountains are there, but there are no windmills. And I remember I came home one time and had a conversation um, I was, came to the back of this meeting where folks were talking about a plant that had shut down and folks were looking for a new set of, uh, you know, opportunities. Um, and, and I waited for a bit as I heard folks sort of share their sets of ideas and, and, and requests and wants. Um, and I asked a question. And then my question was, you know, are the folks in Maryland better than our folks here in West Virginia? 
and everybody kind of turned around. Um, and, and I said, because you know, the folks there in Maryland, you know, for as far as the eye can see, they have these giant windmills that are creating economic opportunities that are creating cleaner forms of energy so that, you know, folks aren't dealing with some of the impacts that are going on. And of course, folks are like, well, no, they're no better. So then the next question is, why haven't we moved forward on being able to attract and retain these new sets of opportunities? Because if you don't in Ohio, if you don't in West Virginia, if you don't in Kentucky, then folks in other parts and other states across our nation will take advantage of those opportunities. And the new bipartisan infrastructure bill and the resources that are a part of that give folks an opportunity to finally be able to get into the mix, uh, to be able to begin to move forward. And there are other benefits that of course are a part of that because as we are moving away from fossil fuels, then we are also helping to address that 200,000 people who are dying prematurely. And we know that many of those folks are black and brown and lower wealth communities who are suffering uh, from those impacts. So the new bipartisan infrastructure and other resources give us an opportunity to begin to move forward in a very positive way. The other side of the equation is on the natural infrastructure side and the sets of resources that are there. As we see these floods that are happening, we know that there's you know, rebuilding that needs to happen um, in our wetlands and making sure that we are honoring that space. We know that you know, we have to be able to address these rising waters that continue to go higher and higher. And we know that natural infrastructure can play a critical role there. That's why things like the, the CCC, the, um, you know, the, the conservation corps are so incredibly important, but there are also a number of other people who will, uh, will play a significant role in being able to help us to be uh, protected. When we see the uh, storm surges that are coming from these uh, hurricanes and, and these other significant events, once again, you know, the resources both that exist inside of the infrastructure bill, which there needs to be more dollars there, but also when we see these conversations about the Build Back Better and the significant amount of resources there, it gives places like Ohio and West Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky uh, and Western Pennsylvania uh, an opportunity to be able to move forward in a direction that is gonna be beneficial to their folks. It's gonna be beneficial um, because they're gonna be a new set of economic opportunities, um, both for folks who are interested in jobs and those who are interested in creating their own businesses. There's gonna be opportunities to also um, address some of the healthcare needs that are going on um, and also to address the food insecurity issues that are going on and a number of other dynamics that are a part of that. And you may be saying, well, Mustafa, what does that look like? You know, it's interesting. A lot of folks have seen Senator Manchin uh, on TV, um, and you know that he's uh, asked some really tough questions, and he's also played a role um, in the Build Back Better not being uh, moved forward at this time. But I just want to bring to your attention that in West Virginia, uh, in Southern West Virginia, actually uh, in Southwestern West Virginia, you actually have new development that's happening around something called the Hyperloop. Um, so when you hear about the infrastructure bill and these sets of opportunities, you know, this is around high speed trains and being able to, you know, get from one location to the next in a very rapid form, but also doing it with cleaner technology. And a place like West Virginia, this is actually being developed in coal fields where, you know, many of the coal mines had shut down and people had been you know, looking for new sets of opportunities. These are the types of things that many of our communities throughout Appalachia should be looking critically at and trying to make sure they're positioning themselves to be able uh, to take advantage of, of this set of opportunities that are in front of us. If we're going to do that, then the lessons that I have learned over the years is that communities speak for themselves, that communities have to be in the center um, of the decision-making so that the sets of opportunities and the policies um, are centered. And the other reason that this is incredibly important 
is that as we begin to bring new businesses and industries uh, into an area that are cleaner, we also have to be very, very mindful of gentrification um, and to make sure that if communities are a part uh, in a significant way of framing out this new direction, then we can begin to minimize those impacts because we're truly thinking through from everyone's point of view um, about you know, the sets of impacts that could unintentionally happen. And it gives us an opportunity to really create 21st century paradigms, if you will, 21st century sets of actions. Um, and that means that um, it takes work, it takes power sharing. Uh, power sharing it is something that really came to me in a couple of different ways. It came early on in my career um, when I was spending time uh, down in New Orleans um, at Xavier University with Dr. Beverly Wright, uh, one of the early environmental justice leaders, and seeing a number of elders who came to one of the first meetings, and they were talking about you know, how they were trying to engage in a process and how folks would not honor their voices, not even give them a seat at the table. Um, and it also was reinforced to me by um, someone whose name you might know, uh, Lisa Jackson. She was an uh, administrator at the Environmental Protection Agency underneath of the Obama administration. Um, and how when we would travel around the country, um, she would make sure that we intentionally were creating a safe space um, where everyone's privilege was left at the door and we were all just coming in um, as, as individuals, um, as, as humans, I guess is the best way to say it, uh, honoring that everyone had a value, uh, a blessing to bring to the process um, and um, how when we do that, we begin to better understand the power dynamics that often exist and that we could change that dynamic. We could make sure that folks knew that they were honored, um, that what they were bringing to the table had value. Um, and often we forget some of these basic dynamics that are so incredibly important if we're gonna be able to make real change happen. Um, I know that Gina McCarthy had joined you all a couple of years ago. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Gina um, and Gina is, is such an amazing champion for public health and, and also um, addressing the sets of uh, challenges we have in front of us through the climate crisis. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that when we see uh, some of the reports that come out that talk about the direness that we find ourselves in, that we actually can do something about it that if we can find an opportunity to come together, that if we can leave our partisanship at the door and just ask the basic question, does everyone have a right to clean air? And I think most folks would say yes. Does everyone have the right to clean water? And I think for that, most folks will say yes also. And does everyone have the right to have clean and healthy and affordable food, I think that the majority of people would say yes. If we began to focus on our commonalities and not our differences, if we began to also say, you know what, we can operate from a, uh, a, a, a paradigm of abundance and let's uh, actually unpack what that looks like, then we can also help folks to know that it's okay for us to come together. No one has to lose in the equation that we can all find ways to make sure that, that folks are winning. It's interesting that Dr. King shared some really important words with us um, a number of years ago now. He said that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. I want you all to think about that for a second. You know, when it comes to uh, the, the COVID crisis that we, have been navigating, you know, everyone was vulnerable. Now there were communities that were more vulnerable. We know sometimes because of uh, exposures from pollution, because of pre-existing health conditions, a number of different dynamics. Uh, we don't wanna shy away from that, but we are all in that same boat together. Um, and even though we've had these, these challenges where, you know, folks may have not 
seen eye to eye on some of the precautions and different types of things. We, we all know that anybody can get sick and anybody can unfortunately lose their lives as we move, unfortunately, toward almost a million people. You know, we're all in the same boat also in relationship to what's happening with the climate crisis. You know, you can go to sleep one night and the next thing you know, there's a major flood that's rushing through your community. Um, or there's an extreme heat event and we know everybody can't afford air conditioning. Um, or, you know, there could be, you know, if you're living on one of the coasts, a significant hurricane event or the wildfires or a number of these other dynamics that are going on. The question becomes, will we as a country begin to pull together? Will we um, begin to recognize and honor our humanity? And will we also embrace a North Star the North Star of justice. When we have justice infused into the work that we do, um, then that means that our most vulnerable communities, uh, that means that those who have often been unseen and unheard will have a voice. Um, we'll make sure that those who have been disinvested in now have an opportunity to be a part of transformation. Uh, and for me, that's a part of what justice looks like. And that's also this moment that we find ourselves in. Um, where we don't have to just accept um, the impacts that are coming, that we can get engaged in this moment, both on a personal level and on a more of a professional level, to begin to do our part um, to be able uh, to make change happen. Uh, I'm extremely uh, optimistic and excited that I see so many young people across the country uh, who are leaning in and who are saying that the 21st century is going to look different than the 20th century because we are going to um, do what's necessary um, to make change happen. I see you know, foundations beginning to invest in both natural infrastructure and man-made uh, sets of infrastructure, creating these public-private partnerships and a number of other dynamics that are so incredibly important in this moment. And I also finally see for the first time ever governments um, beginning to not only invite people to the table, but that their voices are helping to frame out new policies like EJ40, which says that 40% of the benefits have to be focused on vulnerable communities um, so that we can make sure that real change is happening. Making sure that you know, some of these impacts that are happening, that there's actually real enforcement actions being and inspections that are going on to make sure that communities aren't being left behind. And then also saying and answering the tough question uh, of will we finally address, you know, the impacts from racism of the past. So I'm super excited that so many academic institutions are now beginning to really fully create these sets of opportunities for the students who are on tonight, bringing their parents into the set of conversations to better understand what's happening as well. Uh, and bringing together a whole group of folks um, who are saying that now is the time, that we don't have to wait on others to save us, that we will lean in and make real change happen. Um, so with that being said, I wanna open it up because I know we have a bunch of questions uh, that we get a chance to uh, go through. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, and we will open it up to, to questions now. Um, and, we can people can put questions in the chat and I will try moderate that but also if you raise your hand I'll let you speak I think that would be even nicer if we could have that that level of interaction so um why don't you go ahead we do have one person with their hand raised I'm not sure whether they meant to uh let's see uh how do I find that though let's see I tell you what, while I'm looking for, oh, here we go. There we go, there's the hand raise. Sophia, did you did you have a question? I'll uh, just, your hand was up or was that an accident? Sophia's not there. Mustafa, let me, let me start off the questions yep. if I can. Um, so you said leave partisanship at the door, which is a, a very nice sentiment. Mm -hmm. 
but let's talk about so build back better is is not happening it it could be happening a little differently with a new name i don't know if that has anything to do with why you were at the white house um but when we look at that and of course you know you mentioned joe manchin not supporting it but there were also um if i remember something like 50 republican senators not supporting it mm-hmm. so when we have that kind of divide, well, can you address that issue? I, I want to be careful how I, how I phrase this, but we do have a partisan divide. And, and th- there are differences with respect to, I don't know, you said, you know, every, we can agree that everyone has the right to clean air and clean water, but is that reflected in, in, in the policies and in what people are supporting? Mm-hmm. So we need to unpack that. So, you know, a part of this is we've got an interesting dynamic that's going on. Um, And sometimes people just don't know the history. You know, when you look at the Environmental Protection Agency as an example, it was actually created under a Republican administration. Um, You know, Richard Nixon was in place. He had his own set of dynamics that were going on. Um, When you look at the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, you know, those landmark acts, you know, there was bipartisan support. Um, and of course, it also came under that, um, you know, under the, that administration um, at that time. The hard work is one, we've got to make sure that we have really educated voters. And that means that we got to make sure that they have the information that they need uh, to make informed decisions. Um, and that folks understand that there's power inside of the vote um, and, and that they utilize it both at the local, the county, the state, and the federal level. Um, And we also got to put forward in front of folks, you know, these examples of how change is happening on the ground so that uh, folks are pushing um, elected officials to do more, to replicate. The question should should be, hey, if these folks over here are able to do this, um, why aren't we doing it in our respective, you know, uh, county? or state, Um, and and that's a part of the process as well because, you know, a lot of folks just don't even know. So that's when you deal, start to deal with uh, sometimes misinformation or disinformation that might be out there um, where, you know, folks just sort of uh, take um, somebody's opinion instead of them being able to actually um, have the information that they need to make better decisions. Now that does not take away from you know, some of these dynamics that we see, uh, you know, our country sometimes pulling apart because folks who actually, you know, um, have a lot of money uh, and want to hold on to that money, sometimes they will intentionally, you know, utilize certain politicians or sometimes certain other entities to feed folks misinformation. That's just Unfortunately, it is a part of the process. The question becomes, you know, each and every one of us, are we going to uh, do our own work um, in helping to under, better understand the issues um, and, and then to make informed choices and decisions um, about what will really help, um, whether it is our community um, or uh, our states to be in a better space? And for me, that comes back to the civic process. And that's why it's so important to protect the vote, um, to make sure um, that those who are carrying the impacts, um, that they have uh, an opportunity to to, to play a role um, and making sure the right folks are in office who will help to uh, address and protect. Uh, And then the other thing is, we wanna also just make sure that the economic opportunities are there as well. So there's a lot that's a part of addressing you know, some of these dynamics that we see happening uh, on Capitol Hill. So let me just address one other part. The Build Back Better had a whole bunch of different important pieces that were a part of it. There's $550 billion that was also dedicated to address environmental and climate related uh, opportunities and and, and sets of impacts that are going on. there has been some agreement around that particular part of the BBB, um, but as you shared, um, you know, it has not moved forward yet. Uh, and there were a couple of folks 
um, um, on the Democratic side who had slowed, uh, you know, had been an impediment. And then there were um, uh, brothers and sisters on the Republican side who didn't really have to say much uh, because, uh, let me, I'll just call it out, Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin um, were, you know, um, if they decided that they wanted to be supportive, then it would have already moved forward. Okay. Um, Dr. Ali, we have a, a question from an IES master's student, uh, Carly. Carly, I've allowed you to talk. So if you want to unmute and ask Dr. Ali your question, please go ahead. Okay. Hello. Thank you for doing this talk. Oh my God. Of course my dogs are barking now as soon as I unmute. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I know this is kind of a loaded question, but um, in places that are more opposed to clean energy and things like universal health care, which is a huge component of this as well. How do you how do you recommend individuals overcome things like gerrymandering? So that our votes and people's votes that support climate adaptation are fairly represented. And again, I know I said this loaded question, but I just had to ask. Thank no, you. No, thank you for it. I mean, that's an important question. You know, it really goes back once again to our vote and how critically important the civic process is. I do a, a talk about the courts um, and, I, and I lecture at a bunch of law schools. You know, we often don't equate our vote um, with all of the components that it is connected to. So when we look at the gerrymandering that's going on, you know, if we began to uh, make sure that there were judges that would fairly, you know, um, you know, uh, look at these issues and engage around these issues, both um, on the state level and, of course, on the federal level and then, of course, on the Supreme Court level, um, then we can make sure that unfair gerrymandering um, and the civil rights laws um, of the past were being honored. Um, so even though it is a very tough moment, we have to continue to stay engaged um, on the civic process. And we've got to help folks to understand how incredibly important their vote is in, in so many different elements. On the part around the clean economy um, and, and healthcare. Uh, so I, I worked on the universal healthcare bill when I worked on Capitol Hill for uh, former chairman uh, John Conyers. And I heard all the healthcare horror stories that were going on where folks were going into bankruptcy and all these different types of things because of the challenges. And the, that was happening to everybody. It didn't matter if you were Democrat or Republican, didn't matter if you come from an urban community or rural community. Um, and we kind of have lost the human face of what's happening around healthcare. We've got 80 million people in our country who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, and you know, a lot of people are struggling because of prescription drug prices, um, because of the costs that are associated. Some folks don't even go to the go to the doctor, they wait to go to the emergency room until something, you know, which becomes their healthcare practitioner. Um, so we've got to make sure that, you know, folks understand that, you know, we've got an opportunity to actually address um, many of the things that are happening on the healthcare space, on the clean economy space. You know, that seems to be a place that even though you'll have people highlight the divisions that exist. When you look at polling, there are a lot of folks, when you just break it down to these sets of opportunities around advanced manufacturing, as an example, um, and being able to bring jobs back into places where plants closed down 15 or 20 years ago, or sometimes longer than that, um, then you will get folks um, who are interested in that particular aspect of, of a clean economy. So we've got to spend time with folks, uh, helping them to understand, um, you know, the, the sets um, of opportunities that are in front of them. And then again, because of the work that I come from, communities speak for themselves. So if folks don't want those opportunities, somebody else will take advantage of them. Okay, uh, Dr. Ali, the next question is from Professor David Gorchoff, who's in the who's a botanist and ecologist. David, uh, you are allowed to speak if you want to unmute yourself. If not, I'll read your question because he did type out his question here. All right, I'll read, I'll read Dave's question. He says, some states want to spend their bipartisan infrastructure bill funds on 
projects other than those specified in the bill, is that legal? How can communities push back against that diversion of funds? That's an excellent question because one of my greatest concerns um, as folks were developing this stuff was the accountability measures. Um, and lots of the dollars um, actually have gone through vehicles that were already in place. Um, so folks have shared that if states don't utilize the dollars for their intended purposes, uh, or if they just let them sit, which we've seen with things like the, um, you know, the, um, the state drinking water um, uh, loan programs, um, then those dollars will be pulled back. Now, we'll have to see if that actually happens or not. The other part of it is that we got to keep a spotlight um, on these resources um, to hold uh, politicians accountable. Um, does it work all the time? No, um, but it is a part of the process. Um, and whether it is academic institutions or, or, or some nonprofits or others, you know, if folks are doing the right thing, then we should applaud them. And if they are not, we should make sure that we are not, that we're speaking out. Um, and that we are putting a spotlight on it. And then of course, there will be those who will utilize uh, the legal system um, if there are egregious behaviors that are going on that are counter um, to what they were supposed to be um, you know, dedicated for and utilized for. Okay. Um, Jeff Jones uh, is a communication design student and wants to know how he can use his skill to raise awareness about these crises. What was Jeff's uh, skill again? I missed that. It was, he's a communication design student. Well, um, and he says he can talk if you'd like. So um, Come on in, Jeff. it's a multi-step process for me here to, to enable on. this, but hang on, um, I can do this. I'm getting, I'm getting good at this. Uh, allow to talk. Jeff, you can now talk. Okay, hi. Um, thank you so much for um, shedding light on these issues. Um, like I said, I'm a communication design student here at Miami, and mm -hmm. I'm surprised that I haven't heard much that we're third on the list for flooding. Um, so as a, as a design student and someone that will be working in the field, like how can I use my skill um, to help bring awareness? Or is there a platform for people like me um, you know, to help raise awareness in these areas. And I also would love to know more about Lake Erie um, because I'm actually from that area and what's happening there. Sure. Um, so your skills are definitely needed. Um, I think you just have to figure out, you know, where you feel um, most, um, you know, well, most needed, I guess. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Storytelling uh, is so incredibly important, authentic storytelling. Um, whether it is working with frontline organizations and communities to be able to um, bring forth, you know, uh, what's happening uh, in their respective communities or areas, um, being able to help people to better understand. You know, it's interesting, you know, when we go to school here in, in our country, we, we really don't uh, have a lot of uh, education on the civic process, um, right. or how stuff works on Capitol Hill or in state houses, sometimes not even in our county commissions. Um, so being able to actually help people to walk through that and help them to understand here are your, you know, your bridges, your intersection points, where you can get engaged and, and how your voice can, can have real meaning and, and can help to move a process um, is important as well. Um, and, and, you know, we live in this age where we walk around with these computers in our pocket every day, whether in our purses or our pockets, you know, where we can create, you know, HD movies and all these other types of things. Um, I've got friends who are now working in the gaming world who are building content into games to help to educate folks. Oh, wow. um, you've got folks, you know, ev everybody has a blessing and a gift. I was raised in a family of ministers, so I always talk about blessings and gifts and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's really interesting that, um, you know, from the communication side, being able to link up with poets, being able to link up with, you know, singers or rappers um, or all these other types of folks can give another dynamic. Because what this is really all about is trying to figure out what is it that resonates with folks. And for those who are in the communications world, that's one of the things that you're always trying to you know, kind of get your mind around is like, how does messaging actually 
connect with folks? How does it capture them? How does it open up their mind? How does it inspire them to action? Um, so, you, you know, you have the opportunity to do that, you know, with nonprofits. You have the opportunity to do that with frontline organizations. You have the opportunity um, to do it on your own um, or to do it in collaboration with, with other folks, you know, other students or other folks maybe um, who you're engaging with. So it, it's a really exciting time for communications because the world is so open um, and they need authentic, honest um, communication. And, um, uh, and for those who are able to move forward with that type of content, uh, folks will find value in that. The next question is from Becky Joan, Jonas, uh, again, one of our IES master's students. Uh, Becky, you wanna ask Dr. Ali this question or you want me to? I will take your silence as I will read the question. Okay, here's the question, Mustafa. What advice would you give to someone experiencing climate grief. Oh, man. That's so real. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for, for raising that. Um, I, I do a talk on that. You know, we've got a really interesting dynamic that goes on in our country. You know, we have a lot of folks who are dealing with multiple stressors that, you know, that, that impact our mental health. Um, and we have to call that out. Self-care is so important. Um, and we also have to understand that, you know, the climate crisis um, is something that, you know, for younger people that you had to grow up, grow up with. Um, and it's newer for some folks, maybe who have a few more years. Um, so, you know, that, that additional sets of stressors means that we have to also be very, very focused on um, making sure that folks have the tools that they need to be able to navigate it, to be able to heal, um, and to also be able to know that, that there is a pathway forward, which is really important um, when you're dealing with mental health impacts, uh, is that folks be able to find a light through the tunnel, if you will. And all of that comes into place. And sometimes we're so busy doing the work of trying to get to this that we forget about the weight um, that is being placed on, especially younger people's shoulders, but it's really everyone. Um, and, and that's why I would love to see our in, environmental and sustainability programs to partner with the folks who are in our psychology programs and our counseling programs um, to be able to really um, come together on sets of, when we talk about sets of solutions, then that has to be a part of that paradigm uh, to help people to be able to navigate what's going on. Uh, because it, it is the climate crisis, it is the food insecurity crisis, you know, it is a housing crisis, um, and a number of other dynamics, and, and the racial, um, you know, the racial reckoning that, that we're also um, going through, all of these different types of things folks in varying levels are dealing with, and that's why we need to have a very intersectional way uh, of bringing sets of solutions together to address those sets of challenges. Mustafa, you and I uh, spoke earlier today, and I, I told you that um, we have a climate action task force. Uh, we are tasked with writing a, a resilience report, talking about the vulnerabilities of people in our community. And in the climate action plan, we're, we're going to have to address those vulnerabilities. So uh, we, we've been making very good progress on, a, on addressing what the vulnerabilities are. Mm -hmm. um, this is this question is I, I think I need more like um, uh, 40 hours of consulting time from you. But what would be your advice for how to get started working with people locally, people who I suspect are lower income and are, are really going to be suffering as the uh, climate heats up here um, and communities of color in, in Oxford and, and surrounding communities? What would be the way for a university like ours to start to start this conversation and 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 as you say, involve those communities and find out what they really want out of this? Well, you know, uh, a couple of things that I often share with folks that it has to be it should be a part of your foundation, and that is the seventeen principles of environmental justice and the HIMES principles to make sure that as you're doing work. Um, that you're very aware of those. Uh, the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice were created in 1991 at the first People of Color Summit. 
by a number of just incredible leaders from all across our country and a few from outside. And the Hemes principles came about a few years later um, by a number of other just amazing leaders that gives a framework for lots of questions that we have. The other part of it, um, and with all the academic institutions that I either you know, uh, work with or teach at, is that we have to not just open our doors, we have to move beyond just opening our doors. We have to be out in communities, um, sitting down, taking time, listening to what are the priorities, what are the sets of things that they're dealing with, and then being able to bring um, you know, the different types of tools and resources that we have to be able to begin the framing out of a direction forward. Um, and when we start to do those basic steps, then I think it's moving us uh, in the right direction to address some of the bigger sets of issues that we have to be able to unpack, whether it's around natural infrastructure, man-made infrastructure, resiliency, adaptation, because in those communities, in many instances, they've been doing work in that space and maybe a different language that folks have been using um, to define um, some of the things that are going on. So we have to find a common language, if you will, as well. And all that comes to actually, if you honor communities enough, then that means that you're going to be in those communities, spending time, leaving, uh, understanding the power dynamics and leaving our privilege at the door and, and just coming together as community members. Is, um, have you heard of the, the CUP program, C-U-P-P? -P? Is, that, is that still going on? It is. Is it still active? Yeah, so there are a number of programs. I wish we had more time, everybody. So, you know, in the early days, we created the Environmental Justice Small Grant Program, which you, when you heard me quickly talk about the Regenesis Project, that was the first grant that they got. Um, then you have the Community University Partnership uh, Grant Program, uh, which I helped to, to create along with some, a couple of other folks. So that's still there. The, the, the beauty at EPA right now is that there are finally a, a, a significant amount of resources to be able uh, to fund many of the really great ideas uh, that stakeholders have um, across the country. Um, and through that, hopefully exponentially grow those out. So you've got the CUP program, you've, you've got more money in the Brownfields program and some in the Superfund program. You've got some new dollars uh, that are uh, moving into some of the pollution prevention sets of opportunities. But I don't want folks to stop there because there are 17 federal agencies and departments that have a distinct responsibility for environmental justice. So folks should be looking at those sets of dollars that are at the department of, uh, um, of uh, excuse me, Department of Energy, and, and also the resources that are at the Department of Agriculture, um, at the Department of Labor, at Health and Human Services, um, and, and I could go down the laundry list, but there are these new um, and expanded sets of grant programs. I'll send a link over um, for folks, um, and you should really take a peek at, at what's going on there. Um, and then the foundations also, um, there are a number of foundations that are making significant investments also um, that you may want to take a peek at as well. You, you mentioned uh, the infrastructure spending. So who, who is looking at that to make sure that the money's spent in a way to redress past injustices? Is, is someone actually overseeing that? Is that? How does that work? So thank you for raising that because I forgot to mention the White House Environmental Justice uh, Council, which is uh, similar to the National Environmental Justice Council it used to be at EPA. They have given a set of recommendations to the president um, and, and to the administration about both the areas that they think uh, folks are moving forward on in the right way and where they um, have made some gaps or mistakes. Uh, CEQ will be playing a role um, and looking, so there's something called the interagency working group. Now there is a White House interagency working group um, that um, all the agencies are reporting into them uh, about their resources, uh, their vehicles, um, and then they will also be reporting back on, you know, once the dollars are out there in the states and the counties. Um, so that will be one of the places, but CEQ will be playing a role in the Department of Energy um, will also be playing a significant role there. Okay, we are just about out of time. We're at 7.27. Um, are there any other questions uh, from, from anyone? Last chance.
last call. I don't see anything, Dr. Ali. Well, let me just share this real quickly before we close out. Okay. We cannot win on the climate crisis if we don't win on environmental injustice. And here's the reason why that you all can take this with you. When you look at uh, primarily where the fossil fuel facilities are located, they are located in communities of color and lower wealth communities and on indigenous land. When we look at our transportation, um, we know where our roads uh, and highways have been placed and that plays a significant role um, with what's coming out of the back of cars and trucks. When we look at um, what's happening around deforestation, which we didn't talk a lot about today, we know that it has been black and brown and indigenous folks around the planet who have been the ones who have been defending those locations for millennia. And we know that we are losing uh, a lot of uh, those lands uh, to all kinds of different dynamics. And then on the agricultural side of the equation, which is the fourth leg of what's happening around the climate crisis, we know that we moved away from traditional farming methods and moved more toward industrial and corporatization in that space. And those are the four main drivers of what's going on in relationship to the climate crisis. And if you have an honest look, much of that is tied back to black, brown, indigenous, and lower wealth communities uh, in, in different uh, forms and fashions. And if we make sure that we're centering that work, it will help us uh, to meet many of the, uh, of the needs in relationship to what's going on uh, with the climate crisis. I have to ask you this, given what you just said. So as, as Miami moves forward, with its climate action plan and we we think about a date to pledge mm -hmm. carbon neutrality it seems to me that you know what you just mentioned has to be a factor in thinking about that date mm -hmm. but we have we have financial uh, uh realities to face do you have any words of advice for picking that date given the that we have to be balancing the the social justice issues that you just mentioned with our financial realities and 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 you know do you must be working with other schools and, and hear about other schools who are picking this date mm -hmm. do you have anything to say about about a specific date even well you know it just depends you know some schools are a bit more uh, uh progressive um and, and how they're moving forward um and some just have a little bit longer journey. A lot of folks are saying 2030 because they are tying that to uh, some of the requirements that both, you know, um, the IPCC and National Climate Assessment, a whole bunch of other folks have shared it is a really, really important date. Um, and then I always say work back a little bit just in case you slip so that you still hit the date that you want to hit. Uh, so I'm telling folks uh, 2029 um, uh, and look for partnerships. Um, with other schools um, and academic institutions um, who are, are doing the work. Look for uh, foundations and others uh, who want to help to accelerate the work and, and, and they understand that resources are necessary. To our board of trustees, um, helping them to have a better understanding of why we may need to make these investments and how it will make uh, us a stronger institution and also attract because students and others are now taking a look um, at who we are, what we stand for, and what we're doing as they're making decisions about where they want to matriculate. Um, so all of those things come, uh, there are all these benefits uh, that if we make the investments um, that will uh, help us um, to, to be better institutions and also help us to help those communities uh, and then in the greater sort of uh, scheme, um, our planet as well. That is very helpful. And uh, I want to thank you for all your wise words tonight and uh, your presence here. And every, every time that I've seen that we've tried to do some sort of turning on the mic and, and applauding, it just, it's kind of pathetic. Uh, we can also do the, uh, people can do the clapping hands thing. There's just no way to, it's the worst thing about Zoom is that there's no way to really collectively show you our appreciation, but let me express our appreciation for your coming tonight. Uh, I, wish, I wish you could come out and visit us and, and spend some more time. And of course you're invited to come anytime and then we'll treat you to dinner and the whole thing, so. 
I appreciate that. And, and I will take you up on that offer and I will come and spend time with folks. And if uh, I, I appreciate, you know, claps and those types of things, but if you really, uh, you, you know, if you really want to honor our time together, then get engaged, you know, reach out to those communities um, where your footprint is and, and others, you know, across the state um, and, and really help to make change happen. That's the best way that we can honor each other um, is by showing up and, and being supportive. Okay. And uh, Pat Willicke was here tonight, by the way. I did, I did see her and some other members of the Willicke family. So thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Um, and that ends the uh, Willicke lecture for 2022. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.